Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to yet another Dreamland. A uh, very, very enjoyable series for me to do, as most of you know. We, uh, we barely made it, but I guess what we did. And we connected with Linda Howe, who is, believe it or not, at the Philadelphia airport, where I guess she just zoomed in. And uh, that was a nail-biter. And our guest, of course, is going to be Bud Hopkins. Been looking forward to this one. UFO investigator, extraordinaire, author of Intruders and Missing Time. So it should be, uh, to say the least, quite an evening. I'm Art Bell. This is a sort of an unusual program. And if it is your first listen, I suggest you mm, sit back in an armchair and prepare yourself. Because this is some pretty fascinating stuff. Now, all the way to Philadelphia, literally, I guess, at the airport, and Linda Howe. And hi, Linda, uh, you're at the airport, actually? Yeah, Art, I'm in a uh, relatively noisy uh, phone booth out here. I'm going to hope that we're going to be able to transmit all this well. And if you hear what sounds like the loudspeakers or the music of an airport behind me, that's because that's where I am. Understandable. Uh, I was in Eureka Springs uh, this weekend at the Eureka Springs Conference that discusses the large complex UFO phenomenon. And one of the guests who spoke for the first time in 28 years about his experiences as a television producer and writer in 1972-74 to 74 with the Department of Defense working on a documentary called UFOs Past, Present, and Future was Robert Emenager. Uh In my new book, Glimpses of Other Realities, I show a drawing that he used in the first edition of the book when it was published in 1974 and was never published again after that. And he explained uh, to me uh, some time back, and I'm going to uh, play an excerpt actually with more details here in a minute, that this drawing was made in the presence of Department of Defense officials who had the photographs and 16 millimeter film taken from two cameras at Holloman Air Force Base in May of 1971 when there was what appeared to be a pre-arranged landing at Holloman Air Force Base in the White Sands Missile Range area. And what I'm going to play for you right now is an excerpt of his telling, really, for the first time, the blow-by-blow, blow, as he understands what happened. And All right, Linda, uh, Linda, let me ask, uh, are you able to hear me, Linda? Yeah. Did you say a pre-arranged landing? Yeah, it assumes, it implies that there was some communication. All right, uh, very good. Uh, this should be an interesting report. Go ahead. Here we go. And uh, I want you to know that the, the cord from my tape recorder and the cord from the payphone don't overlap. <laughs> this will be about five or six inches from the speaker on my tape recorder, so let's see how this works. All right, okay, let's, let's try it. He said that uh, there were three discs, three uh, ships, which was thrown by a ground camera and a helicopter. He even gave me the names of the cameramen. Uh, but none of them seem to be in difficulty or because of the way it uh, sort of rattles down. It's kind of falling leaf. Kind of, yes, yeah, kind of a falling leaf. And it, it landed at the base. But it seemed like there was some understanding ahead of time. I'm not sure about because they said they dispatched a couple of, uh, the uh, afternoon of Perez, I think, is a great monstrous, it's wonderful to see them, you know, flying around, but he, uh, to guide it down or to secure the area, they did have an alert at the base, and I understood that the, I was told that the uh, commander of the base, fire chief, several other people, were there as the craft landed and were waiting, and that the opening of the door and out came out. Uh, I guess 
down to the three really tight-fitting suits, which did not look quite human. They had the, they had those cat eyes uh, look to the sun face, thin mouth. They had a almost like a Samarian looking hat, as a matter of fact, rope design, and even Samarian looking face. To my eye. Like that to be. It's a very large, almost like yeah, yeah. Uh, that they were met and taken to. Uh, there is an area there where the buildings are no longer exist. Could have been. I went there. I asked where are these buildings. I said those two very buildings were torn down. There's no significance to that. It's, you know, they're always tearing things down. They uh, and with the craft, the one that did land was taken down to the end of Mars Avenue and put in a very small hangar. This is what I was told. Uh, they were met by an Alfonso Lorenzo, at least that's the name that, that's on the on one of the documents I have. Who well, was supposed to be uh, a biologist or an electrician? He was a, uh, an x-ray technician or something, radiology. He was in that field. But I never heard that he was really on TVY for foreign technology. And he... He may not have been a tech sergeant at all, I, I, but that's what I was told. But he was, an, uh, he, apparently he was an attendant to one of these beings, took care of their, whatever their needs were. Uh, what was his impression of that? Well, he, he was somewhat freaked out, and he's the one who contacted his friend at work to be on the alert and look for and the film that would be coming, he said, I know there's got to be film. And he kept corresponding with Paul. Paul Shutter. Yes, Paul Shutter. Did I ever get any kind of a personal human reaction to yes. these Yes, he did. he did. His comment was that they, they, to him, they appeared like scientists, you know, like educated scientists. Now, I don't know what kind of communication was done, but it seemed like there was, there was no problem with communicating. There was a, in the drawing in your book, there was that uh, There was line. a staff, which is a half uh, caduceus, is it? It looked like, yeah, a coil around a, a staff. And I he did, yeah, he did mention what that was. That was, um, that was a communication sort of the ability to also, I imagine, to paralyze or to do whatever. It was like the leadership role. And it's very interesting that we have all through our military history, we've had the short baton as a power of, as a symbol of leadership and power. And I kept wondering, I wonder if this is something that we, in our ancient past, have copied, like, you know, like little humans that we are. All right, I want to double check. Is this coming true at all clearly? Well, uh, not very, Linda. Uh, well, not That's very. what I'm concerned about, and it's such an important interview. I understand. So maybe what I ought to do is just give you a quick summary on this, and then good. next week uh, do it again in uh, in the finer audio of abilities I have in my office. All right, let's do that, Linda. Give me a summary because it sounded fascinating. What what was the essence of the report? Yeah, this is the very first time that Bob Emenegger has described the beings in any detail uh, and using the term Sumerian. Uh, he said this was uh, the context within which they were described, uh, the same kind of pleated uh, headdress that rose over a bulging head. Uh, he said the eyes did have vertical pupils. He referred to them as cat eyes. Uh, they were holding a rod in the left hand, which is in the drawing, that had a coil uh, roping around it. That he said uh, the uh, our people understood to be both a communicator and something that they could use as a paralyzer if they were threatened in some way. All right, this is uh, this is fascinating, Linda, but I'm a little bit lost. Exactly where and when did this occur? This was May 1971 in a portion of Holloman Air Force Base. Three uh, discs, this is the part apparently you could not hear easily, uh, came down uh, at, the air, at this particular air base. They were met by a party of us. There were three beings. One of those is the Alfonso Lorenzo name that he was referencing. 
uh, who was uh, in, a, in some uh, scientific capacity there, okay. uh, who was saying that his impression of these beings was that they were scientists. And he was describing that in this meeting of these beings that uh, for all intents and purposes uh, seem to be like uh, the so-called old ancient Sumerian gods, at least in what we have in replicas of stone statues, mm. uh, they and uh, their craft was transported uh, for reasons that he said had something to do with uh, a repair, but he was not sure if that was a cover story and there was some other reason, but that this was put on some kind of a, a truck uh, covered with a tent and transported to a building at the end of a street that was called Mars Avenue. Mm. Um, this happened in May of 1971, according to Emmenager. They were filming at Holloman and filming the documentary in which they described this event then as a hypothetical sequence because that's what the Department of Defense told them to do. And that film was first broadcast in the United States in 1974, about three years after the event. For those who have seen that documentary uh, at conferences or maybe on uh, television in late night, it was uh, one of the last projects that Rod Serling did as a narrator. And in it, it is this sequence at Holloman that he is now describing um, in detail for the first time. All right, what I'm curious about, yeah, Linda, Linda, what, Linda. They described as hypothetical. Yes, Linda, what I'm curious about is why is he just telling this story now? Because he feels that he can. Because he feels that people are ready for it, do you think? Or because uh, something else has changed? Uh, in other words, uh, you say he feels he can. He feels people will accept it or that it's time or what? Well, uh, he does not, uh, apparently, because he said he had checked with uh, some of his still contacts in Washington about uh, speaking at the conference and uh, making these descriptions, and uh, that no one said that he could not. So this is... In a way, it is a step forward beyond the documentary 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gone from hypothetical to the description of a reality. All right. Well, there there is yet another reality. And while we're on the subject, Linda, I know your book is out. Why don't you tell everybody how to contact you or get a copy of the book? Well, thanks, Art. Um, glimpses of other realities. Uh, you can uh, get information about ordering from Linda Hal Productions. Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. I'll repeat that one more time. Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon, H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D is in dog, O-N, Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. And next week, uh, I will uh, redo this uh, so that you can hear his interview clearly. And I'm sorry I got trapped uh, late on an airplane in an airport. Oh, no, that's quite all right, Linda. And uh, if it had been any, any closer, I suppose you'd have been calling from in flight. <laughs> I would have had to. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Well, thanks, and my best to Brad Hopkins. All right, take care, Linda. Take care, Art. That's, uh, that's Linda Howe, uh, literally at the airport. And uh, sometimes that's the way things work out. I thought she had perhaps uh, uh, spaced out on the time change that, of course, we all went through, the one-hour time change. Well, on a summer afternoon in 1964, Bud Hopkins and two others watched a small, round, metallic craft maneuver in the sky over Cape Cod. This daylight sighting marked the beginning of his interest in UFO phenomena. But his first nationally known investigation did not take place until 1975. Well, I understand that. You need a while to think about an experience. Then a UFO apparently landed less than a mile from Manhattan, was observed from various vantage points by a number of witnesses. Bud Hopkins' carefully researched account of this incident appeared in the Village Voice Cosmopolitan magazine and elsewhere and was covered extensively by television and radio. Bud is an accomplished author, probably the nation's uh, premier UFO investigator, 
Andy has appeared uh, just about on everybody's important television show. And I'm sure that you know him, so he doesn't really need a great introduction beyond all of that. Let's go to Bud Hopkins. Bud, good evening. Good evening, Art. Are you able to hear me okay? I certainly can. I hope you can hear me. Just fine. Clear as can be. Bud, um, first of all, welcome back. We had, uh, had you on Area 2000. Now the program is syndicated. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sure glad to have you back again. Listen, what did happen? I speculated there a little bit. I had my own sighting, Bud, and I had to sit back for a long time after it and think about it. Was that the case with you? Yeah, that was the case. And, of course, I didn't think of myself uh, at any point of someone who was going to do investigations. Uh, I was making my art and exhibiting, and that was my life. And uh, <clears throat> it wasn't until uh, this friend of mine uh, reported an object landing near his car and little guys getting out, little figures and so forth, right. in a quite dramatic way that I just simply thought, I've got to look into this. And so I think I was sort of uh, pulled into this uh, business by circumstance rather than by, by choice. But I think you're right about uh, sitting back and thinking it over. You see, no one can overestimate, really, the uh, resistance all of us have to uh, what this really implies. This is the biggest change, the biggest event in all of human history. It is, if it's yeah. going on. And the evidence is there, and it is so absolutely shocking that people who have the experiences are sometimes even more hesitant to accept their reality than the people who are just reading about them on the outside, because sure. it is so shocking. Sure. As you got down line from your experience a year or so, Bud, did you find that you began to question the experience yourself in your own mind, or did you find it became uh, more clear to you? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say, depending upon the day, you might have asked the question, one or the other might have been the answer. <clears throat> there is a, uh, a strange way in which uh, if everything's going well and the world seems uh, orderly and uh, uh, the edges are nice and clean, uh, you just convince yourself it just must have been something. You don't know what it was. It must have been something. So you convince yourself uh, as best you can that uh, it's just something that's going to go away because it, it has to have an explanation. On the days when the imagery comes back in your mind vividly and... Uh, God forbid you've read about somebody else having a similar thing. It comes back to haunt you. Right. This really happened. Right. And uh, so I do think that the ambivalence is bound to be there. Uh, you know, one of the things, Art, that bothers me a great deal is uh, TV programs or whatnot. When they're do dealing with people who've had abduction experiences, they will say so-and-so claims to have been abducted. Right. No one ever, no one, but very few people, will step up and say, I had an abduction experience. I claim this. Uh, what people really say is, this happened to me, it is so confusing, it is so upsetting, it, it was, it, it's totally real as far as I'm concerned, but it just can't be. I'm having trouble even believing it. Sure. So therefore, it's a long way away from a sort of a cold-blooded, clear-eyed claim for anybody. Well, I, maybe it's easier for the storyteller, uh, no matter how it is, uh, how real it is to the individual, but maybe it's easier for the storyteller to, in essence, give themselves an out if the other guy hearing the story says, boy, what a bunch of bunch of baloney. Yeah, well, I don't think it's so much the fear, of, although that does enter into it, uh, the fear of, uh, of ridicule. It's the fact that uh, if you accept the reality yourself, uh, what this does to your whole belief system about virtually everything in the world. Yeah, but there's a lot of fear about about the listener and how they're going to react. I, I remember after my experience, I thought, do I say anything or don't I say anything? I finally decided to, but I was in great fear, bud, about what people would think of me. Yeah, that's true. Well, well this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I've just finished writing a, uh, a an article, which I'll be publishing fairly soon. I'll send to the Mouton Journal. Uh, and the title is... Uh, uh, losing a battle but winning the war, something to that effect. Yes. The basic point is that we're winning the, ba the war uh, about bringing this material uh, and uh, this phenomenon, the abduction phenomenon, to uh, more and more serious mainstream attention. Matter of fact, just last week I had uh, uh, Susan Spencer here from 48 Hours uh, doing some work. They're going to be coming back next week on a 48-hour special. But, I mean, the New York Times, Time Magazine, I've been interviewed recently by, you know, a lot of very fine mainstream people. We are winning the war for simply the idea that this has got to be taken seriously. Whatever uh, idea about it you want to have, whether you think it's uh, some completely strange new modern psychological aberration or whatever, or whether you feel that these events are real, 
uh, still more and more people are coming to the conclusion you can't just sit on the sidelines right. uh, without looking into it. But the battle we're losing is the fact that a, a particularly virulent group of uh, what I call true believers are people who believe that this cannot possibly be true. In other words, they have a very narrow belief system. These people uh, like to think of themselves as debunkers or skeptics or whatever, but there's a very narrow group of them who have set about almost single-handedly to make a climate exist, to bring about a climate of opinion that makes it almost impossible for serious people with a lot at risk to come forward and talk about their experiences. Sure. That battle we're really losing. I've worked now with maybe 450 people, something like that, one-on-one, -on -one, who have had abduction experiences. And uh, one of them was a NASA scientist. I, I was just approached the other day by my sixth, seventh, rather, psychiatrist who's had uh, his own experiences, police officers, military, and so forth. Uh, some very, Actually, a person I'm going to be working with shortly, um, her father uh, was up for an Academy Award recently. A major category. These are people from all walks of life who uh, now, it, it, I mean, of course, if they did come forward, it would be extremely important for the credibility of the whole issue. Right. But, but I was going to ask, what happens to a NASA scientist who claims he, uh, or claims publicly that he was abducted? Well, <laughs> might be looking for a new job. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, I would say to any NASA scientist in a situation like that, don't go public. Because the climate that's been established uh, of ridicule uh, by these virulent, uh, uh, you know, reputation trashers, really, sure. uh, is such that it's, uh, they are trying to create a climate in which nobody can come forward and talk about this objectively in terms of personal experience without enormous risk. And to show you the level of the risk, I've received two letters, two different people, women, who had uh, <clears throat> uh, explored their experiences, and now we're in the divorce court. And their husbands were trying to get custody with the ch of the children on the grounds that the wives were crazy because they believed they'd had these experiences. Mm. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, well, if you were a, a neurosurgeon, if you were a uh, police lieutenant, uh, would you ever come forward and talk about that under the present uh, uh, climate of ridicule? No, I don't think so. So I, it, I advise people not to. It's really amazing that this many do, and if you get a yep. chance to talk to them first, you say, no, don't do it. I actually do. Uh, now, I'm involved in, a, in an extremely important case uh, here in New York uh, involving witnesses to an abduction, uh, an abduction that was evidently put on for people to see. I mean, an, uh, a very important political figure was involved as a witness, and it was a kind of a show for this person, uh, uh, I believe, as you, uh, the inferences you make from the evidence. And there are numerous uh, witnesses, wow. including a new uh, witness that I have just recently uncovered. But the point is, I have given the advice to these people not to come forward because uh, the uh, the skeptics are ready to savage sure. anybody who uh, who reports this kind of experience. Well, I was about ready to ask you for some names, but obviously that's <laughs> not going to happen, is it? Yeah, I can't do it. Can't do and it. And that's, uh, that's a, a big problem. That's a battle which we really are losing. How big a person, how big a person are we talking about, Bud? Well, we're talking about... <clears throat> um, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, how to, uh, let's find an analogy. Uh, Let's say uh, the importance of the level of, let's say, a former Secretary of Defense of the United States, a former uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, something oh of that my. level. Oh, that, that's, uh, that's... We're talking very, very high. Yeah, that's... But a... the point is... Uh... All right, Bud, listen, the point is we're at the bottom of the hour right now, <laughs> okay. so let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. My guest is Bud Hopkins, and uh, this is already fascinating stuff. You're listening to Dreamland on a Sunday night from the CBC Radio Network. This is a pre-recorded, previously broadcast program. From the kingdom of Nye, this is Greenland with Art Bell on the CBC Radio Network. Another Sunday night, another Dreamland. My guest is Bob Bud Hopkins. And uh, he really ought not need anybody's introduction, and he really doesn't. He is the nation's premier UFO investigator, author of Intruders and Missing Time, and talks about all that sort of thing. And he's telling us now about a fascinating case, actually, uh, involving somebody up high who's had an experience, an apparent abduction, 
and uh, has been interviewed recently by 48 Hours. And, Bud, I want to ask you about 48 Hours. Have you noticed any sort of sea change, Bud, in the way uh, 48 Hours and other programs are, uh, are, are coming at you? In other words, are they more serious about the subject? Absolutely, Art. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And I believe that this really began, the change began back in 87, because it was a simultaneous uh, appearance of uh, my book, Intruders Through Random House, uh, Whitley Strieber's book, uh, Communion Through Morrow, and uh, Light Years by Gary Kinder. I've forgotten the publication, pu the publisher, but it was a major publisher. Three books came out at the same time taking the subject very seriously, and they were uh, published by major publishing houses. And uh, it, it, at, at that point, there was just no way that uh, the press could totally ignore this. And things began to change at that time. I, I was favorably reviewed in the New York Times and the Washington Post and places like that. 2020 did a piece and so forth, uh, plus, you know, lots of other things. But the point is that... Uh, the public is extremely interested in this because I yes. think there is a subtle awareness in this country that this has never gone away, that the subject just, <laughs> the evidence is there and that there's an, ev uh, there's, there's an ev effort on the part of the government and other people to keep this quiet and people just want more and more to hear about it. All right, I, I'd like to understand, Bud, what you can tell us about your own success. In other words, you are regarded, so well regarded, uh, throughout the mainstream media, and why is that compared to others who are ridiculed, frankly, and laughed at at times? Why? Well, I, I, I don't think, I, maybe you should ask the press to, to answer that question instead of, my, uh, instead of me. I can just tell you what I try to do, and that is, uh, I try to uh, never make any assertions beyond those that I feel the evidence can really support in a very clear-cut way. Uh, I tend to uh, sit on aspects of the phenomenon which uh, are more outré, more peculiar, sure. uh, which I cannot really support so well by clear-cut evidence. Uh, a lot of people want to go with the, the most, most dramatic story they can find, uh, which, of course, then makes it sound as if, even though they may be very sincere and, and actually have some evidence for it, but it, make, it, it makes them sound a little bit more like the supermarket dreadfuls, those sure. little papers, than, um, you know, uh, serious individuals. And I think that uh, I can say I haven't really had to retract anything that I've written uh, over the years simply because I've been very careful. And I think that, that carefulness uh, comes out because in, in people's response and they feel that, uh, well, here's somebody who doesn't sound uh, wild and crazy and does uh, marshal his evidence and uh, uh, perhaps he should be attended to or listened to. I think that's perhaps, I, I, I hope, that's uh, the reason why uh, I have received more attention on some of these subjects from mainstream pe people. All right. Uh, what about people like Phil Class? Phil Class, I'm going to have on the program in in debate uh, in a few weeks. How has Phil treated you, evenly along with everybody else, Bud? Oh, uh, the man has lied, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, I, you see, when we talk about balance uh, and Philip Class, it would be as if you were having a program on uh, on politics, <laughs> and supposing I were uh, uh, Senator uh, Oh uh, Senator L Lautenberg, say, uh, and for balance you got Lyndon LaRouche. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I understand. I'm going to have him on with Stanton Friedman, though, and Stanton can hold his own. Well, he can hold his own. But, you know, uh, I, I, years ago, Mort Saul said that he defined a liberal as a masochist who will buy and read everything a bigot publishes. <laughs> and uh, I've always thought of, uh, of, of Philip Class as essentially a bigot. There's no sense of his having an open mind um, on any of these issues. And uh, just to show you what's... The, the typical situation why I can say these very harsh things, and I'm, I don't say harsh things about many people, but uh, uh, as an example, he wrote a book attacking uh, me at, at great length and attacking a number of abductees, uh, Charles Hickson, uh, Betty Hill, uh, uh, Kathy Davis, uh, you know, many, many different people, sure. uh, attacking the entire phenomenon and had never interviewed or spoken to a single solitary person that he wrote the book about. All right, let's 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 look at motivation for a moment. There are those who say he works for the government, he's part of the disinformation campaign, or do you think it's just a personal thing with him? Uh, well, I don't I, I don't really know. I shouldn't even say. If he's working for the government, the government's not getting its money's worth. Let's put it that way. Um, I don't know what his, what his problem is. I think he adores the publicity. 
Uh, but at any rate, uh, I'd just like to make one point very clear. This is an example of the way he operates. He started attacking uh, abductees, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do this in, in any kind of even attempt at a gentle way of saying, well, maybe these people are misguided or something. He implies everyone is a liar and a crook. Uh, and uh, this is his basic. It, recently in the Times, he said, uh, he was quoted as saying, these, these people aren't crazy, meaning there isn't a, a mental problem. Right. Uh, they're just little nobodies. This is the only way they can get on the Oprah Winfrey show, which I think is, of course, a wonderful piece of self-description on his part. I'll ask him about that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's not the voice of a scientist. That's the voice of a, of a mad fanatic. And let's always remember that uh, Santayana defined a fanatic as someone who, when he loses sight of his goal, redoubles his efforts. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, but the, this is the point I'd like to make. Uh, he started attacking uh, abductees a long time ago, saying if they really had these experiences, they would report them to the FBI, uh, which is kind of funny. If you're Charles Hickson and you're in Tuscaloosa, Mississippi, in the middle sure. of the night, how do you find the FBI? Absolutely. You, know? you go to the local police. But at any rate, uh, he said the reason they don't report to the FBI is because there's a federal law against falsely reporting a kidnapping, which would imply that they are aware of that law and therefore they're since they've made up the whole story. They're afraid to report it. Right. Well. Of course, uh, to report it to the police, there's a, there's a state law always against falsely reporting a kidnapping, too. It's the same same thing. It doesn't make any difference. You don't have to bring in the FBI. But uh, years ago, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, we got a uh, uh, an internal FBI memo describing uh, an abduction reported to it in 1967. And copies of that were sent to class, of course. Uh, meanwhile, when I did the Oprah Winter show with him one time, the only time I, and I will never do it again, the only time I ever uh, <laughs> appeared with him, uh, I handed him a copy of my letter to the FBI reporting all of the cases that I had been working on and demanding an investigation. Oh, really? How do you react to that? <laughs> well, he was, uh, of course, his immediate thing was to uh, counterattack and say, well, you should have done it earlier, you know. Huh. And, of course, it was a, an exercise of futility because the letter I got back from the FBI was exactly what I expected. You know, dear Mr. Hopkins, the FBI does not look into such cases. Please report it to MUFON, etc. At uh, any rate, hmm. uh, the basic point is that as recently as two weeks ago or three weeks ago, something like that, someone was interviewing him, and he went into his FBI routine again and said, uh, maybe because of the law against it. Maybe that's why, to this day, no one has ever reported a UFO abduction to the FBI. Now, that is an outright lie, which he knows to, to be a lie. I don't know what's eating the man. He certainly seems to be an unhappy human being. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I wish you well with your experience. I think I've talked as much as I want to about this man. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, my next question would be a really broad one, uh, Bud. What is it, in your view which is and has been for years now been seen in our skies what what are all these things how many of them would you say are legitimate possible extraterrestrial visitors of some sort right well um, the uh, the first point is as to what they are i mean obviously none of us know what they are in any kind of absolute way we know what they aren't yeah the word alien defines something uh, in terms of what it isn't. You know, when I'm in Mexico City, I'm an alien. It doesn't sure. say anything about me. Uh, the basic point is they're not from Nebraska or wherever. I mean, they are an alien phenomenon. Therefore, what we can say about their origin and their nature is uh, uh, always speculative. And uh, I always quote uh, to show the impossibility of getting at it correctly. Uh, Scott Rogo once made the remark that he didn't, I think he must have regretted this, uh, he was a, a good man and, and died far too young, but he did make this little slip, and he said he didn't believe that UFO occupants were extraterrestrial because they were not doing what extraterrestrials would do. Oh, and, and how does he know what... <laughs> well, that's just the problem. Yeah. So when people get into arguments about, uh, oh, I think they're interdimensionals, and somebody says they're time travelers or they're extra... whatever, I just sort of slink away from the argument. Uh, we know that they're not human. We, what do we know about them? Uh, we know that they obviously exhibit intelligence. They have a humanoid appearance. Uh, they uh, have obviously a, a technology which is uh, thousands of years ahead of ours. They seem deeply interested in us. They are deeply foreign to us in their sense of uh, uh, not really understanding human emotions. Uh, we know many, many, many things about how they behave. 
but as to what the bottom line is, uh, what their goal is ultimately, what they're going to be doing uh, a year from now, 20 years, 100 years from now, we have no way of knowing. And you you are no, you. <laughs> okay, but you are nevertheless convinced that they are in one of those categories, whether yes. it's interdimensional or it's extra galactic yeah, or whatever. They, it is. they are physically real at least some of the time. Now they seem to be able to uh, dematerialize, uh, virtually disappear, and so forth and so on. Uh, whether that's whether you want to talk invent a term called interdimensional or whether we want to just say it's an advanced technology. Uh, you can flip a coin; it doesn't really make any difference to me. But the point is that uh, they represent a non-human intelligence from elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, which is of enormous uh, advancement over us technologically and so on. All right. We are a commercial operation, so we're going to do a little of that right now, Bud. Relax for a second. We'll be right back to you. Yeah, okay. All right. My guest is Bud Hopkins, and uh, if you've been listening, you well understand what the subject matter is. We'll be right back with more of it. Are we going to take some calls tonight? Yes, I'm we are. I'm interested in that. Yes. Uh, well, they're coming up in the next hour, Bud. Uh-huh. Good. Um, absolutely. Are these friendly beings, or are they... Um, what are they? Are, are, in other words, we see one of these things. Uh, what would you advise a person? Uh, walk up and offer your hand or run like hell? <laughs> well, the, the, the truth of the matter is you're probably not going to have any choice one way or the other in, in this. Uh, they seem to be able to uh, uh, control the situation as they need to. Now, the basic uh, point about this, which is extremely, uh, I think, central to understand, um, is that all of our science fiction uh, uh, films and the simple stories and so forth have always dealt with uh, visitors from outside, extraterrestrials or whatever, uh, as one of two types. Either they're going to come as conquerors, body snatchers, etc., right. or they're going to come uh, as saviors to uh, clean up the environment and clean the, put, close up the hole in the ozone layer, etc. They're either going to be, in other words, uh, gods or devils. Yes. And uh, neither one of those uh, descriptions fits what we're getting. What we're getting is we might call a third world, a third force. Uh, they seem to have their own agenda. Their own agenda does not uh, involve any kind of causing of deliberate pain or deliberate uh, hardship or taking over the world or anything of that sort at this point because they've been here for a long time and I have abduction cases that go back to 1929. Uh, they could have done an awful lot of mischief had they wanted to in the meantime. And, of course, in all of that time, there is absolutely no sign they've done anything to help us out either. Uh, the, nothing stopped, uh, uh, for instance, the Holocaust. Nothing stopped our dropping bombs on Hiroshima. Nothing, nobody stopped the Korean War, the Vietnam War, or the, the carnage and the genocide that uh, various factions have practiced. Since then, uh, nobody stopped the spread of AIDS, uh, the problems of cancer, the difficulties with our planet, uh, the environment. Uh, they seem to be bent on their own purposes, which are not uh, malevolent or benevolent. And that's a very tough one to understand. All right, so then maybe w w they're closer to actually just monitoring what we're doing. Well, they seem to be monitoring it, but they seem to be taking material uh, from us and taking from us uh, with as little disruption as possible, it would seem, any, as little di uh, uh, deliberate disruption. The involuntary disruptions, the side effects of what they're doing are truly horrendous. Uh, I don't think they understand the uh, the terror and the confusion and the self-doubt and the, uh, the family disorders and dysfunctions and so on that follow in the wake of what they've been doing over these years. Uh, but I don't see that those are uh, intended results. Uh, so uh, they are taking from us our genetic material and our DNA, uh, our particular genetic makeup, uh, because it seems, and this is the, the, the basic theme of my book, Intruders, and really this has been replicated and is accepted by virtually all abduction researchers that I know of, uh, they are picking people up in childhood and picking them up again at intervals throughout their lives right. as objects of study. And they seem to be taking uh, sperm and ova samples and genetic material uh, in what is apparently an attempt to create a, a mixture of themselves and ourselves, mm. uh, a hybrid being. And you know, quite along with that, they seem extremely interested in understanding our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings about one another, our sense of relationship with one another, love we feel for one another, uh, for our children, and so forth. All of those uh, 
uh, wonderful human things they seem to lack, and they seem to be very anxious upon it to, to acquire them. Well, as you look at their behavior, Bud, would you say they're more likely... Uh, oh, let's see, how can I put this? Would you say they're more likely our creators, or they are tampering with what has been created? Boy, that's a tough one to answer. I mean, we're out in real deep speculation. I mean, there are a lot of people who talk about them as our creators and uh, so forth. Uh, uh, the idea being that we must have some uh, common genetic route for uh, a hybrid program to work. I really don't know how to answer that. My feeling, though, are actually is that uh, on Earth we females carry their babies for nine months. The fetus is in their bodies. Uh, and when they give birth, there's a tremendous sense of connection, of bonding with their children. If you imagine some kind of developed species, which no longer reproduces by that method, uh, which no longer has females that go through the discomfort and uh, warmth and everything else of carrying a child inside the body and giving uh, it nurturance, nurturance and so forth, uh, if they have evolved past that and they somehow need that, they feel that perhaps they've reached some kind of evolutionary dead end. And there are reports that would suggest that, that we can't, you know, again, we're in speculation. Okay, again, that it is they have reached the dead end. Yes, exactly. They have. rather than us. I think they're envious of us, to tell you the truth. I think that uh, they're gaining uh, spiritual and emotional nurturance from us at the same time that they're uh, taking, uh, forcibly, I should say, our genetic material. All right. A lot of people speculate in order to do that, there was with our government or somebody a deal made, Bud, a long time ago, uh, a, some kind of a technology swap for yeah. genetic tampering uh, permission or whatever. I think that's uh, totally without foundation. I think it's even kind of ludicrous just on the ground that uh, if all we've gotten out of it is uh, some stealth technology, as people uh, allege, uh, stealth uh, planes manage to cost an inordinate amount of money and don't even work very well. Um, I don't know what we've gotten out of it. I don't see anything that we've gotten out of it, that uh, any kind of a quantum leap in uh, technology. I wouldn't, uh, on the other hand, say that we haven't perhaps found uh, wreckage if they have had accidents and acquired that wreckage and tried to reverse uh, engineer that wreckage in in some way to learn what makes their equipment go but uh, uh, the idea that you know I, I always used to think uh, you know, just, uh, under the previous administration I always sort of made a joke about it that I always saw a little the idea of small gray men with clipboard standing in Dan Quayle's office with a list of children they wanted to abduct that week or, yes. or aluminum siding salesman or whatever. I mean, it's just totally foolish. They can do whatever they want to do. They don't have to ask any government position, permission from anybody. Uh, I think that that kind of theory gets uh, uh, foisted upon us because a lot of people who look into this have a natural paranoid tendency. And uh, uh, the uh, I don't mean that in the strict clinical meaning, but Conspiracy theories are wonderful oh, for a lot of people. They abound. And, uh, of course, you understand uh, paranoia uh, is a wonderful thing because it instantly organizes what's otherwise chaotic. <laughs> you know, if you and I uh, have a, uh, uh, a flat tire in the afternoon and lose a poker in the evening, we think we had a couple of bad breaks, but the paranoid will tell you who did it to you and why. That's right. So uh, the point is that if there's a lot of paranoia about the UFO phenomenon, there's, of course, tremendous paranoia and some of it obviously very deserved on the part of uh, belief about the government. So if you can put the two together and say the two are working hand in hand, uh, we've got a kind of very satisfactory thing. To uh, all right, you, al you almost speak as though there is not a government cover-up. We're close to the top oh, no. of the... Uh, no, no, no. There is one. Absolutely. But there's a big difference between uh, complicity and some kind of a deal that, uh, where the government or some branch thereof is, quote-unquote, allowing the aliens to abduct thousands and thousands and thousands of our citizens daily. So, in other words, you think the government may understand uh, that it is here and that they are here and even have evidence of that, but not really know what the story is themselves? Absolutely. I think ah. that they, their, their knowledge is, is far more extensive, I'm sure, whatever branch this is, than my knowledge or anyone else's. But uh, the point is, what can they do about it? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, I've used this example again and again. If all a president can say is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, they're here and they're flying around, they can outfly anything we have, and they're taking our people uh, on these uh, one and two and three hour uh, abduction 
uh, events, medical experiments, uh, sperm and ova sample being taken. They were race people's memories. We have no idea uh, what it's ultimately leading to, whether they're going to be friendly or not. We don't know what this is all about. There's nothing we can do about it. Thank you. Good night. We'll talk about it when we hear more. So in other words, why say anything? You're just going to scare a whole bunch of people. And Without any, could you imagine being in the bond market when something like that dropped? No, I cannot. Bud Hopkins, <laughs> hold on. We're going to take a break. Top of the hour. Then we'll come back and take phone calls. This is uh, Greenland. On a Sunday evening, I'm Art Bell. My guest is Bud Hopkins, nation's premier UFO investigator. Get close to your telephone. Get ready, because you're about to have an opportunity to speak to him. Eight hundred six one eight eight two five five. One eight hundred six one eight eight two five five. First time callers, area code seven oh two seven two seven one two two two. Or the wildcard line at seven oh two seven two seven one two nine five. This is the CBC Radio Network. And we own the night or evening, whatever day part it happens to be. My guest is Bud Hopkins. And as the man just told you, those are the telephone numbers. The telephone lines are now open. Bud is our nation's, I believe, premier UFO investigator. I'm uh, honored to have him on the program. Bud, are you there? I certainly am. Okay. And if I may uh, just make a comment, because we do live in the real world, too, with this, all the rest of this, I'm always I'm sort of astonished at the, uh, the heavy-duty right-wing ba bias of the uh, news reports we're getting. It's really quite a new program. Uh, it isn't so much news as a little sermonette about how bad uh, uh, anything liberal is. I'm surprised, but anyway, I don't want to uh, short-circuit what we're talking about. But we do live in the real world, and these other things are important to us, too. They really are. And uh, does the twain ever meet, Bud? Uh, oh, yeah. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, 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 the twain meets in the sense that uh, these experiences, uh, and we're again dealing with the whole abduction phenomenon, these experiences uh, have such uh, powerful effects on people's lives that uh, there is no way that your day-to-day -day existence is not affected uh, very subtly uh, by what's happened to you. Now, just to give you a quick example, if, you were, uh, if you've, these experiences have happened in childhood, and that's where they seem to always start, versus abducted as a little child, and uh, you're five years old and you wake up uh, and you can't move, you're totally paralyzed, and you feel there's some strange figure that's come out of the closet or whatever with his huge black eyes, and you feel yourself floating or whatever, and uh, you don't remember all of the experience. You come back with a, uh, a cut on your leg that wasn't there. Maybe you're upside down in your bed, or maybe your pajamas are no longer on. They're on the floor or something, and it, it, all the signs of physical problems. And you start calling out for help for your parents, and your mother says, you just had a bad dream. Get back in bed. And you try to say it wasn't a dream, it was real. Right. Uh, what happens, is, of course, is a terrible kind of uh, uh, split develops between the child and his or her sense of trust of, of adults. And if the adults begin to feel maybe something like this really is happening, they begin to feel a tremendous sense of, of impotence, of helplessness in, in protecting your own families. And much of this can remain unspoken. And it does not help anybody in your day-to-day -day existence, whether you're talking about your first grade teacher or your friends at school, you're afraid to let them know that uh, you're, these strange things are happening to you, which you think, am I crazy? Is this me? Or what, what is this? Sure. All so, right, uh, but well, one other thing. You brought up politics, so one question, then we'll go sure. to the phones, and that is this administration, they've revealed an awful lot about the nuclear testing and a bunch of other yeah. baloney that's gone on. What, what kind of hopes do you have that they're going to release information or what they know about UFOs? Well... My hopes are slender, sad to say. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, we have been hearing day after year after year after year that this, this is the year and they're going to come clean and so on and so forth. I honestly don't see how they can do that without really uh, terrifying the country. They've put themselves in a completely terrible position by the government cover-up program because by uh, denigrating the experiences of literally millions of people, uh, they're really saying, you didn't have these experiences. You either made them up, you're a liar, or, uh, or you're mentally ill. It didn't happen. Some, some problem psychologically. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, very much like on a, on a national scale, scale what I was describing within a family, sure. where the parents are telling the children, this didn't happen to you. You just had a dream, and the child knows it wasn't a dream. Uh, the, the people who have had these experiences know 
that the government is lying to them. And, of course, it means that they have no place to go for help, uh, although we're trying to uh, supply that uh, as best we can with our limited resources. Uh, numbers of researchers and mental health professionals are turning around to uh, this, but can it mean, I mean, to help people as best they can. enormous damage and of course if they admit now after years of lying about it uh, as I said I wouldn't want to be in the bond market when this happens so they're really in a spot right all right let's take some phone calls uh, on our toll-free line you're on the air with Bud Hopkins good evening where are you calling from please um, Portland Oregon Portland Oregon all right go ahead um, well I had a recent experience um, um, and I was just wondering how familiar this is um, not too long ago I was I had just gone to bed with my fiance, and it was quite late, it was about midnight, and um, uh, I felt as though something had entered my room, mm -hmm. and I opened my eyes, or tried to open my eyes, and my vision started to just kind of blur, mm -hmm. and then my hearing went out, and I was completely paralyzed, mm -hmm. and um, all I really do remember seeing is something kind of dark, um, and not too huge, but kind of large. Mm -hmm. And um, then I remember trying to yell or scream for mm -hmm. my fiancé, and all I remember being able to do is kind of mumble and groan a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then not too long after that, he was shaking me trying to, as if he was trying to wake me up. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that had happened, I still couldn't move or hear or anything, and then there was like this this loud wind in my ears mm -hmm. and then I was able to get up and scream and tell them to turn on the lights and mm -hmm. that's basically all I remember except for that the next morning I woke up and had a bruise across my sh shoulder that hadn't been there before. No. Well, uh, this is uh, something that should definitely be looked into and we have some people in uh, Portland and you're very fortunate uh, to be in a city where there's a, uh, a, a very sensitive investigator uh, who, whose name I don't want to give over the uh, air here. Uh, this is what I would su suggest you do. If you write to me, uh, and this is the address for anyone who uh, wants to describe an experience, just write to me, uh, care of if, just the initials if. It stands actually for Intruders Foundation, but just say if. Okay. Box 30233. Okay. And that's New York, New York. And the zip is 10011. Okay. Now, if you write to me, and you, uh, we will put you in touch with uh, a very um, uh, skilled and helpful and very, very warm person, uh, an investigator in the Portland area uh, who has had these experiences herself, and she has a support group and people who can be of help. But your experience should very definitely be looked into. All right. Well, I have another question. Does this usually happen um, because um, not too long before that I had had kind of a sighting. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what I'd seen, but it was definitely something not usual or out of, you know, kind of... All right, all right. Listen on the radio for us, please, ma'am. Is that typical sighting and uh, experience? It, it's not necessarily... Many people have these experiences without remembering a sighting or uh, without having had a, a recent sighting. Uh, according to uh, the Roper survey, it would... It would suggest that perhaps uh, more people have had abduction experiences than have had UFO sightings. Hmm. Uh, so uh, yeah, we used to think of the abduction uh, as a kind of a bizarre, uh, very minor aspect of the whole phenomenon. But now I think it's, of course, the central purpose. And UFOs are, uh, as it were, the getaway car. And as I pointed out, we have uh, we spent originally before we accepted the idea of abductions. We spent many years. I try to get the license plate number on the getaway car without having figured out what the crime was. Right. Uh, so UFO sightings are not necessary and are not necessary for someone to have had these experiences. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Good evening. This is Fritz from Los Angeles. Los Hi. Angeles. Yes. Okay, Fritz. Go ahead. Now to a very serious, sensitive subject about the alien. Way back in 1965, I learned about two alien federations on the cosmic doorstep. Now the kind ones with a democratic, utopian, free will belief, and the not-so-kind ones with a socialistic, I'm your leader, you will follow me system. What I want to say is that for hundreds of years there has been a great conflict over who will connect with this solar system. Now, my question to Bud is, have you heard new research running into this conflict about the two alien races out there 
who want to see this take over the earth sooner or later. All right, thanks, Ritz. Well, we've got the left and the right in this country. It's kind of a question about uh, extra-galactic politics. I, I would say that uh, uh, what's been described here is essentially, uh, with all uh, due respect to Fritz, uh, it sounds to me like the kind of pro uh, projection that we get from people who... Uh, uh, want to put this in the duality of uh, gods and devils, uh, gods and demons, and so forth, uh, that I was talking about earlier before. I haven't seen in the 18 years I've been doing this kind of research, uh, I haven't seen any sign that we have different groups doing specifically different things. Hmm. Now, we have different physical types described from time, time to time, but they very often are seen in the same ship doing the same kind of uh, work with human beings that uh, I've been describing. Do you think that they are in contact with each other, aware of each other, or could we, uh, are we being simultaneously contacted uh, or sporadically contacted by many different groups and different origins? Very hard question to answer, Art. Uh, what I said, though, essentially is, uh, as an example, in one uh, California case, uh, the woman reported uh, uh, small gray figures with huge heads and black eyes, uh, and a tall figure that was more insect-like uh, with uh, huge eyes. Uh, people have made associations with the praying mantis look and so right. forth. And other pe uh, in that same ship was a relatively speaking normal human being. But they were all cooperating in these um, genetic experiments as I've been describing. So uh, it would seem that we don't have different groups doing different things. I, I suspect that uh, uh, we, although we have no idea where the place of origin of these figures are or whatnot, they still, there doesn't seem to be a different, uh, different group doing different projects. Kind of a consortium then. Yeah, it would seem to be. All right, on the first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Well, good evening. Uh, I can't believe I got through. You have, where are you calling from? This is Bill in Albuquerque. Yes, Bill. And I wanted to ask Mr. Hopkins if he's the one that wrote Missing Time. I read that book. And I forgot it completely. Is he with the alien? <laughs> you mean you had a missing uh, missing memory about a book, right? Yeah, about missing your gun? book. About your book. <laughs> no, my question is brief. Uh, I want to know if you think that we have experimental aircraft that flies as fast as the speed of light. All right. All right, Mr. Bell. Uh, I would doubt that very seriously. Uh, I I'm not a scientist, and uh, but uh, I would doubt very seriously if, if we have anything that uh, remotely approaches the speed of light. I think that there are undoubtedly uh, uh, aircraft under uh, you know in the, in the planning stages, advanced aircraft of one sort or another, and also there is uh, evidence that has come up actually in. Uh, uh, to, in Nevada and so forth, it would suggest that perhaps there's been some reverse engineering of crashed uh, UFOs, right. which would suggest an attempt to try to get something to work. Uh, but uh, the idea that we've got anything that can go near the speed of light, that if somebody had that, uh, NASA would be out of business and somebody would be making zillions of dollars at it and so on. So. What about modes of travel? But I've heard a lot of people talk about the bending of time and space and leap across that bend. Uh, have you heard a lot about that? There, there are lots of, of theories of that sort, and uh, we really don't know what to make of it. I mean, I, I don't. Um, as I say, leave that kind of speculation to other people. I'd rather stay with the data and uh, away from uh, uh, heavy speculation. It's it's a, it's fun to do, but uh, it, we know that this is going on uh, in the lives of many, many millions of people, actually. Uh, how they get here, how they travel, where they're coming from. I mean, the idea, for instance, that they are necessarily locked into a uh, planetary system some, somewhere is not necessarily uh, true. I mean, it's highly possible since we are... Uh, we have had up in space a Skylab at one point, and space stations are going to be built by us in, with, within uh, not too long a period, um, uh, orbiting Skylabs. And uh, one could imagine that an environment could have been constructed, and it could be uh, movable through space, and so they might not be tied down to a planet. Who knows? All right, good. Well, I think that's why you're so highly regarded. You don't, uh, well, on a moment's notice or a second's notice, leap into the unknown. We don't. Yes, we, no, don't. That's, we that's, don't. No. Good. All right. Good evening. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Lawrence Laboratories, Livermore, California. Uh, uh, very good. Well, I'd like to contribute by helping uh, Bud Hopkins and your audience understand the nature and the origin of UFOs. 
All right, sir, are you on a uh, speakerphone, and if you are, could you pick up the telephone? Well, I can't do that because I'm on an unsecured area, and I don't want my that's fellow fine. workers to know tonight. That, that's just fine, then. Go ahead. We'll All put right. up with it. Um, <clears throat> just before Einstein passed away in the 50s, he was working on the time continuum theory and trying to explain it. Uh, UFOs are simply our descendant scientists from the future who are visiting us from all points in the future and studying mankind without interference. And on what basis do you conclude that? Well, Lawrence Laboratories in Berkeley is, is working on some of the projects. Well, uh, oh. the, the idea of, of uh, time traveling, of course, has been... Uh, brought up many, many times uh, as a theory, and uh, I don't see that really changes anything, frankly. Uh, I'm really taking a chance in even talking about this. I understand, right. and you are giving us news. Can you give us some idea of what technologies you're talking about, please? Well, the, the different crafts that you see are simply the different time machines, modes of travel machines that are from all different points in the future. They're simply scientists who are coming back with a policy of non-interference studying the history of mankind. That's why they're taking DNA samples to the to the future to find out what has gone wrong with mankind in the future. Uh, that's quite incredible. And uh, they're not extraterrestrials. They're from right here. They're from right here. That's why we see ships, as you call them, materialize and dematerialize, because they're simply going in and out of time. The, the issues, uh, the descriptions, of course, here uh, of uh, time traveling, uh, uh, I mean, it fits one of the uh, modes of, of explanation of the UFO phenomenon that we've had for a long, long time, uh, along with, you know, ideas of interdimensionality and so forth. Um, so what you're saying is, as a theory, it's been around a long time. The news would be, if you can say officially, uh, that this is some kind of uh, government, uh, I mean, that, that uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories is working on something. There is a point in the future where mankind learns to travel in time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... And it's less than 200 years. Uh -huh. Well, the issue would be if, <laughs> if some kind of statement could be made that would be official about this, that would be you the know, big news. Maybe this caller would like to comment on the paradox problem since you seem familiar with... What well, there is no paradox if there's non-interference. All right, good enough. All right, I've got to run, caller. Well, there is, of course, an amazing uh, amount of interference. Uh, lives are being interfered with uh, daily. Uh, suicides have resulted in this. In other words, the, the interference is extraordinary. Uh, so uh, it isn't a question uh, of, of it, well, let's say, deliberate interference in the sense that uh, governments are being changed or altered or something, but lives are being altered on a, in a vast scale. Uh, I don't feel it's possible to say uh, there's been no interference. But that was a remarkable call. Would you like that person to contact you privately? Well, I, I would like to hear more. Yes, absolutely. And he could, uh, uh, that address could be given. I would like to talk to him about it. Uh, as I say, the, the, the theory has been around for a long, long time. The question is whether or not um, there's some kind of uh, official statement uh, coming from you know, from a, from a, uh, a research scientist. Absolutely. All right, uh, that, but hold, that's the news. Yes, that, that might be big news. But yeah. hold on, we've got a couple of things to do. Let's get those done. And let me give Bud's address. Uh, write simply to if I F box three zero two three 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 zero two three three, New York, New York one zero zero one one. Did you get that? If box three zero two three three, New York, New York one zero zero. One one, and we'll be back to Bud Hopkins in just a moment. I want you to know it. Okay. All right. Um, hello there. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Grants Pass, Oregon. Yes, K O P E. Yes. Go ahead. Hello there. Hello there. I find this absolutely fascinating. Good. Uh, have uh, who am I speaking to? This is Bud Hopkins. Oh. Have you heard of the Sumerian uh, story of how uh, humans came to Earth? Uh, this is the, you're talking about uh, the ancient astronaut work, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Sitchin's work and so forth. Um, yes, about the two brothers who came down from um, uh, a corrupt planet. Their father was the yeah. uh, leader, and his 
his name was phonetically written as a star. One of the brothers had a staff with a meta with a snake on it. Yeah, this is and material you, you've gotten from Sitchin's books, is that right? Uh, some of them, yes, yeah, and some right. of the ancient writings of uh -huh. the Sumerians. Right. I find this absolutely fascinating, and I find it also uh, uh, plausible. Do you? Uh, since they took the fertilized egg of, the, of a human being here on Earth and uh, re-implanted it in the egg of the female astronaut, mm -hmm. it seems to me so modern in its concept um, but then they wouldn't have any idea that this were pos this was possible. Right. All right. Well, thank you. we're way short on time. It's yeah, almost essentially, mythology. Essentially, I, I I just I hesitate to ever speculate on ancient astronaut issues. There's so much going on. Uh, I've I've had two two people call me not too long ago in the past months. Two people call me uh, after they had been returned from an abduction that had that had ended within about a minute or two from their phone call to me. Mm -hmm. And to worry about mm -hmm. the, the Sumerians at this point in my life is, seems a long way away. I'll leave that to uh, the uh, the historian. All right, uh, Bud, we're at the bottom of the hour. Almost, It's almost mythology, isn't it? Yes, it really is. All right, uh, Bud Hopkins is my guest. This is Dreamland on a Sunday night. I'm Art Bell. If you'd like to join us, pick up a telephone. Uh, I know it's very busy, but keep trying. You will get through. You're listening to the CBC Network. This is a pre-recorded, previously broadcast program. From the Kingdom of Nye. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. And Bud Hopkins, good evening everybody. Uh, an unusual opportunity for you to talk to uh, what I think most of us consider to be our nation's uh, premier UFO investigator, Bud Hopkins. Bud, are you still there? I certainly am, and I'd like to make a comment here. The, uh, your uh, point was uh, uh, the man was on a speakerphone a minute ago on the uh, Lawrence Livermore call. Well, when I first heard him, I thought it was a speakerphone, and it may have been, and it also sounded like a portable because I heard it kind of wishing around a little bit. It, uh, oh, I see. What did he say it was? Uh, what do you mean? I forgot what he said, what kind of phone it was. I'm a little suspicious of the call, frankly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you had a chance to think about it. You you thought it was perhaps uh, not real at all. Uh, people don't tend to call and say I'm calling from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, to tell you the truth. It's true. Uh, and um, uh, that's the, if someone is from a very highly uh, secure area uh, making a phone call and uh, having his voice go out and so forth uh, with uh, apparently uh, sensitive material, it's not the sort of thing that you announce on them. It is true. We're talking careers here. Yes, exactly. It's much more likely to say I'm uh, a truck driver who stopped at a truck stop here, but I have this information. Yeah. You know, this is what I have heard or something. Uh, anyway, so that's, we can move on, but I just wanted to say for the audience, I may be doing this gentleman an injustice, but uh, I'm not so sure about it. Let's see what you get in the mail. <laughs> okay. All right. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hi, uh, I'd like to... Uh, All right, hold on, sir. Don't do anything yet. Turn off your radio first. That's number one. Okay. All right, now tell us where you're calling from. All right, my name is Eric, and I'm calling from Eugene, Oregon. Eugene, Oregon. All right, mm -hmm. go ahead. And I'm calling to find out, are you familiar with uh, Al Bielik and his time travel experiments? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, how, and, and how likely are they right now? How likely do you think that, um, they are? All right, thank you. Uh, that's a question about the credibility of Al Bielik. Yes. Well, it, that's a hard question for me to answer because I'm not as familiar with it as I should be. I'm aware of it. Uh, I know that uh, he has devoted a lot of time to... Uh, uh, writing about it, lecturing about it, and uh, I would I would prefer to just let this one kind of dangle. I I don't like to step out and pontificate in areas that I'm not uh, as uh, sure as my knowledge and information as I should be. All so right, I'll well let, let let's this one go. All right, let's go away from Al Bielik though, and let me ask you about the Philadelphia experiment. Did something in your view, Bud, happen? Uh, 
My my general sense is that no, it did not happen uh, in the way it was originally reported. Now, uh, of course, uh, 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 Mr. Moore, who wrote the book about the, the Philadelphia experiment with with Berlitz, I believe, together, um, has since felt that uh, the evidence is not uh, really uh, com compelling that uh, such an event took place. That was a long time ago, and obviously every single one of these uh, uh, issues, such as that that amazing event, uh, the disappearance and, and reconstitution of a, of a ship and so forth, uh, if something like that were, were feasible, I think uh, we would have used this in one way or another, militarily or, or commercially, whatnot. Uh, one of the problems, of course, with all of these ideas of uh, which, which verge on conspiracy theory about right. uh, super duper government, uh, 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 all military gear or, or material that could have military usage, is that uh, people forget we went through a war and the Gulf uh, War recently, and uh, of course we had no real uh, special equipment in that war that. Uh, gave us the ending we would have liked to have had mm -hmm. uh, if we had had some really incredible equipment. I think right now, as I've always said, Saddam Hussein would be sitting in a jail cell right now next to uh, Noriega, and we would still have Bush as president. We would still have the head of the CIA as the head of CIA. The Joint Chiefs of Staff would still be in place and so on. Uh, none of that happened. It All right. Was, well, that's a, that's a really good point. What about the other major event in uh, fairly distant history? The one in New Mexico that Representative Schiff is now going to cause the GAO to apparently investigate. Well, that's a very different issue because uh, that uh, has to do with alien technology, not military technology, uh, such as the Philadelphia experiment would it would indicate. Uh, this is an alien event. I have absolute. Uh, now, I, after after many years of studying the the, uh, the evidence and and noticing uh, more evidence as it's accumulated, uh, some very good research. Don Schmidt's been doing wonderful research on that. So is uh, Stan Friedman and a number of people. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I definitely feel that something crashed, a UFO crashed, or two perhaps. Uh, there was the uh, speculation that two collided. Bodies were recovered, material was recovered, and I have no doubt about that at this point. All right. Uh, very good. And on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hi, Art. This is Brandy in Bakersfield. Brandy in Bakersfield. Hi, Brandy. Hi. I was disappointed because baseball preempted this show, so I've only been listening since 8.30. Oh, well, we're sorry about that. Well, I mean, it's not your fault, the people at KZR. But anyway, I wanted to say it's a pleasure to speak with you, Bud. Uh... I just wanted to ask you, since you've researched this for many years, do you think that demonology plays any type of role <laughs> in these abductions? And also, is there any way that uh, Whitley Streeper could also come on the show? Uh, uh, all right, all right. Take well, it off the air. Thanks, Art. All right, thank you. And, of course, there is. I'll answer the second question. Demonology, I'm sure you get that one a lot, bud. Yeah. Well, uh, again, as I've tried to explain, we have a basic need to kind of shove the whole... Uh, uh, alien phenomenon, uh, abduction phenomenon, UFO phenomenon, into the idea of, of gods or devils. And uh, I do not connect this with uh, uh, any kind of theological uh, beings, demons, just as I don't connect it with theological beings, angels. Uh, I think that this is a very distinct phenomenon. Now, I'm not going to say that I don't believe that uh, there are necessarily gods and devils in the real world. I don't want to get into a theological hassle here. We'll get a million calls from people. Uh, consigning me to hell from my opinion, so I will <laughs> stay right. away from that. But I definitely feel that uh, this is its own business. It is not connected with demons. Uh, there are uh, very, very possible uh, uh, mistaking identity situations where people feel uh, the child is uh, possessed of a devil or whatnot who is having abduction experiences, and it might be kind of hard for some people to tell. Uh, I had a case where a woman uh, here in New York her parents were um, uh, rather uh, not very well educated, um, uh, first generation uh, Italian family, and uh, they used to bring in the priest every now and then with holy water to bless the apartment because these strange little men with big black eyes were coming through the walls. Oh boy. And what else to do? They must be demons. So there is some confusion here, but uh, I think it is a separate phenomenon. Well, let me turn the question around. Is that one of the main reasons that we're not told about all this because of the Re reaction in religion, religious uh, circles. Well, 
I mean, that is certainly possible. Uh, that uh, it, it, it creates a lot of problems for uh, religious people, but it is not necessarily an insoluble problem. We have to remember, because, and I should mention that I have worked with a number of born-again Christians uh, who are also abductees, and uh, there was a problem for them of reconciling what was happening to them to uh, their abduction experiences. Sure. And as I pointed out, uh, you know, many years ago, uh, it was believed back in the time of Galileo that if, it, if the idea was accepted that we were not the center of the universe, that we were simply in a planet going around the sun amongst many other suns, uh, then that would mean the end of religion. And because it was against the Bible, it was this, that, and the other thing. And that was what the theologians of the time believed. And, of course, now virtually everybody understands that we are just a planet going in a particular solar system. But that has not damaged religion. Religion managed to, theologians managed to make sense of this and harmonize this new information with the Bible. And um, Christianity has not uh, suffered as a result. And I think the same thing can happen with this. All right, good. Well, I want to get off course here. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Uh, Spokane, Washington. Spokane, Washington. All right. Uh, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, sir. Yes. How many of these uh, abduction cases were preceded by a red light, a ball of red light coming through the wall first, like a probe? Well, many, many people who have had abduction experiences uh, at one point or another have noticed unusual lights or balls of light in the room with them coming through the wall, coming down the hall, whatnot. Often people describe these lights as acting as if they're intelligent, as if they're looking at you. Now, right. I'm curious about, since you raised the question, that you must have had an experience along these lines. Yes, sir. More, much like the, young, the, the one the young lady related about well, 15 minutes ago when she was paralyzed. Yeah, well, that's a classic account. Yeah. What was your experience, sir? Well, I woke up, I called before and talked to uh, Linda Howe about this and also uh -huh. Mr. Bell. Uh -huh. But um, I woke up to a droning, whirring noise in the room, this whirring, you know, a, a mechanical droning. Uh -huh. That woke me up. And I looked up and he had a gigantic crucifix on the wall. And the ball of light came out the crucifix and it just pulsated there about the size of a baseball. Uh -huh. And then it tracked the ceiling, went over the ceiling, went down her side of the room, and I tried to wake her up. And my girlfriend's really like sleeper. I said, wake yeah. up, please wake up, look at this. And she wouldn't wake up. Yeah. And when it got on her back, it pulsated for 30 minutes on her back and she was sleeping on her stomach. Mm. It then proceeded off her back onto my chest. Now, once it got on my chest, I couldn't scream out no more. Yeah. I couldn't move. I started sweating because I was fighting it. I was trying to sit up in I bed, but I could not move. All my eyeballs could do was go round and round. Yeah. Next day, I, I, I passed out and went to sleep. Yeah. I woke up about an hour and a half later, and the ball of light was leaving my chest, going off my body to the floor, back on the crucifix where it just pulsated for about oh, a minute. Uh -huh. And it just went into the crucifix and out the wall. And right. it took me about oh, a half an hour to recover before I could get up. Right. Now, but I was going to ask you, have you ever had anybody, uh, you know, do a study? Well, my last name is Simon. Uh -huh. And um, have you ever had anybody do a study to see how many people were, with religious last names, you know, are being tracked? And ha like Abraham, uh, I, I, I honestly, right, Mr. Simon, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that uh, uh, any particular person is being singled out for this because of uh, their religious beliefs, their last name, or anything of that sort. I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon. We're getting this in areas where there are no Christians to speak of, for instance. These things are occurring in, in, uh, in China, in the Orient, uh, in um, uh, the backwaters of Africa, South America, and so forth, with, with people with uh, very, very definitely non-Christian uh, beliefs. This is not something that is limited uh, to people with uh, uh, with a particular religious background, uh, I think that's a coincidence in your case, sir. But uh, it's it's you're, what you described, though, certainly seems like something sh that should be looked into. So, uh, again, if you'd like to write, I can uh, put you in touch with somebody, uh, perhaps near you. Boy, the M.O. is beginning to sound familiar now, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. Well, Art, it, uh, let me tell you that when we did the Roper survey, one of the questions we asked was, "Have you ever?" Uh, and, and these were not beliefs, these were, uh, have you had these experiences? One of the questions they asked was, have you ever um, seen unusual lights or balls of light in a room with you? Which neither you nor anyone else could explain. And actually, 8% of the American people said yes to that, which is extraordinary. To that me. is extraordinary. So yeah. even if you say uh, that's... Uh, that's uh, uh, four times too many say, uh, but to cut it down to mistakes or, you know, uh, people misread things, you're still dealing with a very high percentage. And even if it's, as we uh, found with the Roper survey, using uh, five basic uh, indicator questions, 
one of which dealt with the paralysis, just as both of these uh, people have explained, have described it very eloquently, uh, a period of missing time where they have no idea where they were, how it happened, or why it happened, and so on. With these uh, five questions, we came out with 2% of the American people said yes to four out of five of these questions, which would indicate if they are abductees, and it's certainly likely, uh, we're dealing with, uh, say, perhaps five million Americans who, are abduct who have been through this. That's a lot of occurrences, but hold, hold on just a moment. We'll come right back to you. Fire back to the telephones, and on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from? San Jose, California. San Jose, good. Hi, uh, Art. Hello, Bud. This is Tim from San Jose. Well, Tim, how are you? I'm fine. How have you been? So very well. Uh, I just wanted to share something with you. Um, yesterday morning, uh, my daughter and her mom had an experience. They had a visitation. Uh-huh. Uh, her mom woke up with an extremely sore throat, nauseous, nose, uh, nasals were stinging, uh, disoriented. <clears throat> she had a blue fluid coming from her nose, one nostril. Oh, boy. Uh, she threw up and she called me. <clears throat> uh, I was curious if you'd heard of any sort of blue fluid with other cases like that. Well, uh, that's coming from her nostril. Was there any way of saving any fluid? Uh, she wasn't thinking of that at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of different uh, uh, strange fluids uh, from various bod bodily orifices which uh, stain have created stains and we have uh, uh, saved the material. Uh, it's very hard to analyze some of this stuff if you don't have much of it and if it's very embedded in fabric. It's quite expensive to do it. But things like that have been reported more often, actually, kind of a brown fluid. Yeah. Uh, how, how about your daughter? Uh, she seemed to be okay. We took her to an uh, emergency pediatrician just to make sure. Uh, I tried to share this this phenomenon with him. Uh, I showed him the pamphlet that you and the Bigelow Foundation right. wrote, uh, Unusual Personal, personal uh, Experiences, I think mm -hmm. it is. Uh, he wasn't receptive at all. He laughed about it, shrugged it off, and didn't even want to take the pamphlet. Well, did, did she report anything specifically uh, happening, or, uh, her recollections, the daughter? Uh, no, she had no recollection of the event. But was there anything physical? Uh, not, not to her, but to her mother. Yeah. More to her mother than to her. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's hope she wasn't taken. No. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, thanks very much, Tim. I'm, you know, sorry this happened. Uh, this, these yeah. have been extremely difficult uh, situations to handle for a family, but uh, I think you're doing a fine job. Would you recommend somebody like that, Bud, uh, investigate further, contact somebody, find out if, in fact, the child or the mother or both were taken? Uh, well, I certainly would. The, the mother has, has worked uh, with uh, a psychologist in the area who's very, very helpful, has done a very good job, and uh, uh, since I know Tim, uh, there is uh, there are various people in the area, including another pediatrician and others who, who could be helpful. We do have quite a... Uh, uh, a group, this is uh, generally in the San Francisco uh, area. We have some very good people out there. Uh, so uh, he, uh, Tim has got some, uh, some support, which is very helpful to him. And, uh, but is there any uh, geographic area that is visited uh, more frequently, apparently, or is it just simply uh, completely random? It's very, very hard to tell because... Uh, obviously, what you hear about is only what <laughs> the press or, or letter writers or whatever uh, are willing to, uh, to present. And, of course, if, if it's a very conservative community where this is frowned upon, uh, you're not going to get uh, uh, people talking about it as openly. For instance, in, in New York City, uh, I have uh, people reporting these experiences who are, let's say, uh, white, middle-class uh, people, etc. I have quite a few African-American background people and Hispanics, but very few Orientals. And it isn't that I think this isn't happening to Oriental people, but I think that uh, in, in such numbers, I think that there's a, a reticence perhaps as a societal norm uh, in that particular group to talk about this sort of thing. Some sort of cultural bias. Exactly. So if you go to, for instance, the Bible Belt uh, a town in the south, there might be a lot going on, but it might be attributed to uh, uh, to demons or it might be something that people feel hesitant to talk about. And so you simply would think, well, we have a big blank in this area. We're not getting any reports. And yet, it, that might not be the case. No, that's a good point. Uh, on, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Yes, good evening, Art. Fascinating show this evening because I'm curious, going back to when you talked about a lot of this happens to children when they're younger, have yep. you ever dis discovered that this was uh, either a cover-up for child abuse 
or that child abusers have used this, used this uh, uh, guise or uh, for uh, UFO abduct uh, uh, abductions. All right, or, or but the other way around. Well, that's see, that's a very interesting point, and I'm glad you brought that up because this has been. Um, uh, the uh, let's say the explanation du jour of uh, many uh, groups of, of uh, uh, skeptics on the subject that uh, the essential point is people uh, they believe are being sexually abused and are somehow uh, blanking out that memory and substituting for it a fantasy where they bring in aliens which uh, is, is an issue they can handle better than the fact that it was old Uncle Sid or Aunt Martha or whatever whoever who did the ab abusing uh, and, of course, if that were the case, we would expect to find amongst abductees a very low level of people reporting sexual abuse. And, in fact, uh, from the work that was done by Dr. Kenneth Ring and other people uh, with abductees, we get just as high a percentage of abductees reporting sexual abuse by normal humans in the, the bad old way uh, as we get with people who have not had abductions. So there's no sense that then these people are... Um, uh, as a group are substituting abduction experiences what's, uh, since they're remembering the child abuse too. What's mm -hmm. more, uh, and I'll give you a very quick and very sad story, uh, I have a number of cases like this. Uh, in this case, told me by the mother, uh, her little boy, and this is rather graphic and I'm sorry about this, but her little boy at the age of, uh, uh, I think he was five or four, uh, she was divorced. Uh, he was having uh, the husband had visiting rights, and the little boy would stay with him on the weekend. And uh, the mother said, who was a registered nurse, she found her little boy uh, in his bedroom uh, with a screwdriver, which he was trying to insert in his rectum. Oh my God! And uh, he told her when she was, of course, horrified. He said, "That's what the man does. Uh, he has a." uses a tool or something like this. Well, at any rate, she naturally assumed naturally. Uh, sexual abuse on the part of her husband, uh, who vehemently denied it, but she went to court and got a court order barring her husband uh, permanently any visiting rights whatsoever with the child. And the husband moved away, and of course, within a couple of months, the child was again talking, and he had, he had some, some damage to the uh, tissues, rectal tissues. Uh, he said the men had come in again, and they had big black eyes, and they were sca uh, he was frightened, and they had used some instrument there, and uh, plus a whole other range of things he was describing. I wonder how many times Uncle Sid is in jail because of an abduction. Well, I can assure you that it, it must have happened because I have many cases where, uh, a number of cases, one in which a woman had thought that she had been raped by her father at the age of 12 and uh, she had harbored these feelings all her life, never accused him, he never really changed his behavior, but the description of the uh, rape scene, which I can't even go into, it's, and it's, it's very, very odd, uh, it, there's nothing about it that sounds like a rape, but her father was present, and uh, as we explored the experience, it seems that it was a, an abduction of the two of them. And uh, at one point, uh, he was in the ship without clothes as she was in the ship without clothes oh boy. and uh, things are being done to the two of them so it was interpreted uh, as a rape uh, but I, I, I can assure you that just even the questioning from uh, uh, what she remembered consciously uh, had nothing about it that suggested violence uh, she remembered that she was lying down that she was unable to move that uh, she had no clothes on whatsoever uh, there was no sense of any violence or struggle uh, she felt that Something was inserted into her body. Uh, there was no sense of, of, a, of another figure, of another body in relation to hers, etc. That her father was standing off to one side, unmoving. Nevertheless, and, uh, but it, it isn't really a defense you'd use anyway, is it? It wasn't me. It was the grave. Uh, no, that, it wouldn't hold any water. And I, and I really do feel... Now, see, there may be some cases. I, I would not ever say that there aren't any cases where... Uh, what the gentleman suggested might not have happened, where somebody could have invented some sort of story. Uh, Lord knows uh, the the mind is very fertile when it comes to trying uh, to cover up uh, trauma and rationalize. It is. It on. reaches out and tries to explain. But we're at the top of the hour, so relax for about five minutes. We'll do one more hour. Okay. Bud Hopkins is my guest. Uh, fascinating night. We'll be back with more in about five. A lot of the abduction accounts talk about implants, and mm -hmm. it's like in the nose, right. the nasal area. Uh, my question is, why don't we see 
um, these devices and it would seem to me that if someone felt they had an implant in their nasal area that they'd go and get um, some type of scan like an MRI or a PET scan right um, it seemed like it'd be really easy to to detect something like that with the um, technology that we have today all right well that is a good question very good question and have we detected any bud yeah now uh, this is a complicated subject I'm getting much more interested in as time goes on uh, there have been, uh, I, I know now personally of two cases where uh, an x-ray uh, indicated uh, the presence of a, of a strange object. And uh, before the x-ray, uh, before anybody could do anything about the situation, in one case the x-ray was not in the possession of the person with the implant until a week after it was taken. Uh, that person was reabducted, uh, found herself bleeding from the nostril when she woke up in the morning, and evidently our little friends in the sky had come back and removed it, as if uh, when the x-ray was uh, taken, some alarm bell goes off, so to speak, and they come and take it. Uh, the second case happened to be a woman in um, uh, whose, whose child, it was uh, actually the child involved, was about a five-year-old girl uh, who who had been having abduction experiences and uh, uh, she had an accident completely unconnected with UFO. She fell off her bicycle or some such thing and they thought she had fractured her skull and she was taken to the hospital whereupon the doctors, this again in Italy, uh, discovered uh, a strange object. Uh, by the time she was taken back to uh, uh, the army base where her father was stationed in Germany and she was re-x-rayed, again the object was no longer there. Boy. Now I have those x-rays in my possession and they beyond any doubt show uh, foreign objects of metallic origin. These are uh, have been looked at by Dr. Paul Cooper who is a neurosurgeon uh, who uh, is a friend of mine who looks at such things for me. I have recently received a case from uh, of, of again a woman, an abductee, who in another accident thought she had fractured a skull and the uh, radiological report uh, describes uh, a metallic object in the uh, parasagittal area of the brain. Uh, I know through the investigator Barbara Bartolik, who's done some very fine work on this, I have other uh, images of, uh, actually it's a videotape of, of the x-ray and MRI showing uh, a foreign object in the medulla and another one uh, which shows an odd object uh, with a very clear-cut symmetrical shape uh, in the hip bone. And the man had been abducted, uh, had terrible pain in his hip and even the scar right opposite where this... Uh, objects seem to be. I don't know what uh, doc, what Barbara Bartolik is doing with those cases, but the point is the ones that are in the head are in places where it would be extremely dangerous to try to retrieve them. There have been some objects that have been recovered uh, from the nostril and two from the underside of different men's penises of all things. Uh, these objects are not radio opaque, do not have uh, any kind of heavy metallic uh, makeup. Uh, there are a lot of uh, more organic elements, carbon, uh, silicon, and uh, so forth. I, I believe, I don't know on what program, but I saw somebody actually holding one, Bud, which appeared yeah. to be triangular in shape and kind of crystalline. Yeah, that's the glass-like uh, object. Uh, we don't know much about, I mean, I, I've held that in my hand, too. Oh, you have? Actually, I've held several of these things. Uh, however, uh, this is the big problem. Uh, the objects that have been recovered so far, unlike these metallic objects we have not recovered, um, are an, made of enough familiar uh, elements, especially, uh, as I said, silicon, carbon, and so forth, that uh, uh, no scientist is going to say there's no way that this object couldn't have originated on Earth. Uh, sure. It might be a bit of a problem to imagine how an object lodges on the underside of the, uh, under the skin on the underside of a man's penis. But nevertheless, uh, it's possible to imagine an alien implant which uh, is made of fairly neutral materials, but which is charged in such a way that it does what they need it to do. Uh, we really have no way of knowing what these objects do, why they're there. Uh, and I always use uh, the example to show how complicated it would be to, to guess uh, alien motivations. All right, well, what about this, Bud? Uh, in the case of the ones you talked about where they have it in a portion of the brain, yeah. is anybody talking to these people about signing a release for when they die? 
that's what I would like to do. <laughs> uh, that's what we have to do. Uh, the idea of, of autopsies, uh, uh, that's something we have to, uh, to go into. Now it's very possible that these objects somehow uh, can be removed by the aliens without leaving scars or marks. Uh, obviously, their technology, if they can move a person through sure. a closed surface, sure. presumably they can move uh, a metallic implant through the skull without leaving a hole. How that happens, we have no way of knowing. It sounds totally off the wall, and yet uh, the evidence would suggest that's the case. Uh, at the same time, that sometimes when these things are put in the nostril uh, or the ear, there is bleeding. Uh, so, but, but are we kind of like the caveman tinkering with the Sony? <laughs> we might be. <laughs> uh, but I use the example that if you imagine a very primitive Stone Age tribe in the, in the jungles of New Guinea or something like that coming across the body of a dead um, anthropologist and finding uh, a pacemaker in that man's body, they would not have the slightest idea as to the function of that object. In e that exactly body. so. All right. Well, let's keep moving. A lot of phone calls. And on the uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from, please? Reno, Nevada. Reno, Nevada. Yes, sir. Go ahead. ahead. Am I on the air? Yeah, you're on the air. Go uh, ahead. Bud, um, uh, uh, this kind of goes with the last caller. Uh huh. Um, I was wondering if there were any other symptoms that identify abduction victims. And can I just kind of run down a list? Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Number one, unexplained fast healing injuries. Mm -hmm. Number two, constant bloody noses. Number three, blackouts or what I would call unexplained timeouts. Yeah, well, that's more to the point, yeah. Okay, well, let's. I, I got a whole list here, though, and there's only about three more. Mm -hmm. High intelligence in the victims or unsubstantiated strength. Substance abuse in people that may have been past abduction victims. Uh, All right, caller. Thank well, you. It, is is there any? Uh, the list is. Uh, I mean, a lot of the things you said are very important. Now, the issue of uh, unsubstantiated intelligence. Uh, we have to also know. I've got uh, what case of a, of a man who was abducted who was rather severely retarded. Uh, I also have uh, cases. Uh, it's one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard of. Uh, two people who were comatose in a hospital who had been. Uh, in a comatose state for a long time. Evidently, hmm. uh, after an, a, a UFO visit to the hospital, uh, uh, showed uh, uh, puncture marks on the abdomen of the woman and an incision on the underside of the penis of the man. And these are people who hadn't been conscious for months. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it's hard to know. Now, also, the substance abuse issue does come up because these these are very uh, psychologically undermining experiences. One is thrown into self-doubt from the beginning. Am I crazy? What's going on here? This can't be real, et cetera, et cetera. And this can lead to that sort of problem. So uh, much of what you said is, is, is accurate. So Thank is there any... Thank for bringing this up. Right. Is there any particular profile of abductees? Uh, are, are they brighter? Are they lower on the scale of intelligence? It's, uh, it, it's totally across the board. And, and the demographics, when we did the Roper survey, of people who had answered yes to four out of five of our indicator questions, we thought were possible abductees, uh, just fell across all uh, uh, ethnic, uh, racial, uh, gender, uh, socioeconomic, educational levels, and so forth. There was no consistency. All right. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Yes, I'm calling from Seattle, Washington. Seattle, yes. Uh, Bud? Mm hmm Yes, hi, Bud. Uh, listen, I've been trying to discuss this situation for a long time, and I've, I tried calling that number out in Arizona, and they would never return uh, my call. Here's what happened. Uh, the night that all of the lights went out, on the east coast i think it was like 65 or 66 well that afternoon while i was with my parent uh my mother we were driving in west covina california and i would say uh i saw flying saucer this thing was about i'd say it was between seven and eight thousand feet um i was amazed at the time because i was a young fellow about 15. Mm -hmm. i saw three or four jet planes uh, mm -hmm. follow following it Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they fired what I thought was a missile, and the thing exploded. And it was headed eastbound. This would have been toward the Pomona area. Mm -hmm. And that night, as I say, all of the lights went out on the east coast. Mm -hmm. The lights also went out in the San Gabriel Valley mm -hmm. um, of California around 8.30 that night. 
Well, now you said you reported this to a number in Arizona. I'm not sure what number. There are lots of numbers that come and go here. Yes. Uh, what I would appreciate if you could write to us at the address that, that we've given, and we have somebody get in touch with you, and get some more information. Yes, uh, I'd be happy to. And I thank you very much. All right, thank okay. you, caller. Bye. -bye. Uh, hmm. Uh, but what about effects uh, of UFOs, electromagnetic effects on radios, television, automobiles? Uh, any sense to any of that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it goes with the territory. We, we, again, don't know whether this is deliberate, whether they can sort of zap someone's car, or whether uh, it's a uh, side effect of, of uh, uh, whatever propulsion system they're using, whatever that is. But uh, just to tell you a, a really fascinating recent uh, situation, Dr. David Jacobs uh, was working with a woman who uh, was quite pe petrified. She thought something was going to happen to her that night. She called him. Her husband was away. The two children were asleep. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, he uh, got her to set up a video camera in the bedroom, which she had used on other occasions, uh -huh. trained on the bed. Uh, and uh, she went to sleep. Uh, there was enough light, and it was set at half speed, so it would run for eight hours. Right. Uh, she went to sleep with the children in the bed. When she woke up in the morning, <clears throat> there was uh, uh, she'd been asleep about eight hours, and there was still 25% of the tape unexposed, and uh, it was still running. When she turned the tape on, it uh, it showed the image of her waking up which she did not remember, getting out of bed and carrying each of the children away from the bedroom so the bed was empty. Oh, my. And the very next Ugh. shot, she was, all, she was back in bed with the two children. But it did not show her walking from the camera back to the bed. God, that gives me the heebie-jeebies. Now, that means that that camera had stopped, whether this was, whether it was shut off at, at the source or whether the power was, uh, was interrupted. Uh, and it was it was off for the time that the abduction evidently took place, and so when she was placed back in bed, this is all speculation. But when she was placed back in bed with the children, and the UFO left and the power resumed, the camera just started going again. But here you have a, an impossibility. There, there was no way that the the film could have uh, uh, stopped and started this way uh, w without somebody doing it or some interruption of the power supply. All right, Otherwise, she would have filmed herself getting in bed. All right, I've got one other question in, in this area, and I'll get to it as soon as we come back. Take a okay. brief break. Uh, Bud Hopkins is my guest, and we'll be right back. The oh, hard one to test is right. All right, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hello. I'm pleased to finally get through. Where are you, sir? I'm calling from the Reno area. Reno, okay. K-O-H, no doubt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, a Oh, I have a, a little description of an incident I had while flying in an airplane myself uh, mm -hmm. uh, as pilot. I'm a, a private pilot. Mm -hmm. I was uh, eastbound uh, out of uh, Sacramento, California, heading towards uh, uh, Placerville, uh, just a little south of Mather Air Force Base, mm -hmm. which was an active base. It was about 10 years ago. I don't remember the exact date. Mm -hmm. I remember it as springtime. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, off in the distance, uh, about my 11 o'clock uh, uh, range uh, or uh, in field of view, I saw a very bright light. Mm -hmm. My first interpretation was it was probably a B-52 out there with his landing light on, mm -hmm. uh, on approach to Mather. Uh, so I just studied it, watched it, and kept a note of it because he was out there where in the direction I was flying. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this light proceeded north at an extremely high rate of speed. Mm -hmm. and I mean extremely, it went almost out of sight within, say, two seconds. <laughs> That's fast. And um, the funny part about it, if that was an aircraft of any type, a vehicle that uh, you know navigates through the air mm -hmm. and had a headlight on the front of it or a landing light on the front of it, if he turned away from me, the light would disappear. Exactly, yeah. And this light did not. It grew dim mm -hmm. as, it, as it proceeded into the distance. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of logged that myself in my own mind to say, well, I wonder if I'm going to see something like that ever again, which I never did. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was, I have heard of similar reports, but I, uh, that's the only one I ever had. Well, that's a good one, and uh, I'd appreciate it if you wrote in uh, so we could get some of the data down. And there are people who collect these reports. Uh, incidentally, I don't want to uh, uh, <laughs> do alarm you, but uh, I have dealt with uh, three different pilots private pilots uh, who had UFO sightings and who had, while they were flying, 
and uh, actually two of them were daytime, one at night, and um, they had missing time experiences hmm. in the air. They oh. In the air longer than they had fuel for. Uh, and, oh, and happily, that's not happened to me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I know. That's why I said I didn't want to yeah. alarm you. You yeah. just got to look at one. I mean, yeah. The one you saw was just going by, but I mean, it, yeah. literally, this seems to have happened within uh, within the, uh, the time period of that experience, or sometime later. No, at, while they were in the air. All right, and I, I want to interject here, if I might, to uh, call our uh, question. You remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that magic moment where the uh, controller said, "Do you want to report a UFO?" Yes. Did you? I didn't see that movie. Did you? But, uh, did but you? you reminded me. I asked approach control if they saw something on the radar that proceeded north at a high rate of speed, mm -hmm. and they reported negative. Mm -hmm. And I have another question for you, Bud. Sure. Uh, Very quickly. Uh, do you recall back in the 50s and into the 60s, there was uh, the Air Force had a, an operation called Operation Blue Book. It was mm -hmm. supposedly the big government. Uh, uh, collection of data on UFOs. Yeah. It was uh, called Project Book, and it was very little, actually. It was billed as big, but it was little. But yeah. Go ahead. Well, was that ever declassified? Have you ever had access to the Oh, yeah, the material was, was declassified, but uh, what's happened is that uh, some other uh, reports that we have uh, found out about or got, uh, were de declassified separately. Material was released about some very good sightings. We found out they were not in Project Blue Book. Really? Uh, and so the suggestion was that uh, that the really best cases were not, not put there. So I have, it's I have very a ambiguous story. It's complicated. Yes. I have a little anecdotal information on that. Very quickly. Uh, we'll okay. Call I have a friend who was in Germany in the Air Force uh, subsequent to that mm -hmm. who was uh, highly classified. I mean, he was working in highly classified projects. Mm -hmm. Ran across an officer who was in that Operation Blue Book. Mm -hmm. Asked to say, hey, what about this? You know, we're down here in the vault. Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. He says, I do not want to discuss it, and that is the end of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that has to be the end of that, too. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Paula. Thank you. And, uh, Bud, we're going to have to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. Uh, do you have any quick comments on what he said? No, I'll be, we'll be we, when we come back. All right. Very good. Uh, we'll do that indeed at that time. You're listening to the CBC Radio Network. want to remind everybody, for copies of this program, you can call at any time, 24 hours a day, area code 503-664-7966. 503-664-7966. Where are you? I'm in Gig Harbor. Gig Harbor, Washington, all right? Yeah, uh, KBI. Yes, go right ahead. Um, a, a very weird time loss, um, and I think the whole town experienced the same thing, Art. The whole town? Well, uh, tell us about it. Okay, I was uh, leaving. I, I live on the Olympic Peninsula, Geek Harbor. I was going to my summer home up by Canada at Twin Lakes in Colville. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in a town called Euphreda, which is across the Columbia River, I hit a stoplight, and I was stopped there. I was the first car in line. Mm -hmm. There were no cars behind me. Mm -hmm. um, a very odd thing, it was about 110 degrees out, the middle of the summer, very hot area. Mm -hmm. Someone in a full jumpsuit, kind of a bright orange jumpsuit, was crossing the road. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean... The whole thing was very unusual. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I had what I felt was a uh, time lapse, a blank out. Mm -hmm. um, when I came back to, there were about 30 cars behind me. No one was honking any horns. Everyone seemed to witness the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person was gone. The light was green. No one was upset. Everyone seemed very content. Mm -hmm. And I found it highly unusual. Well, absolutely. Were there cars on the opposite side coming towards you stopped, too? There were no cars on the other side at all. But 30 on your side, which is... Yeah, it, it was like a city block backed up behind me. But and no nothing, and nothing coming towards you. Pardon? And nothing coming towards you. That's very odd. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Now, tell me I mean, about the, the man thing... in the orange jumpsuit. Uh, how did he move, and did he look normal, and so forth? What did you... he, he was walking uh, uh, apparently like a normal human being. Uh-huh. And uh, 
I, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like this. I have no explanation for what happened. Well, I would like to hear from you about that, sir. If you could uh, write to me at the address uh, that uh, I'm sure Art will give again, uh, I would like to follow up on this because we have cases like this which involve uh, quite a few cars. Now, these experiences, uh, many people in a cliche way think that this is just something that happens to one person at a time, but uh, I have cases which involve uh, uh, conceivably hundreds of people at once. Uh, and, and certainly in abduction cases that, where I've investigated them, where the same experience happened to everybody, uh -huh. uh, seven people at once and so forth. But uh, your situation, I think, should be looked into. Do you have any idea of how much time elapsed? Uh, see, that's, that's the whole thing is uh, I, I'm really not certain because it, it, well, things like this happen out of the blue. Yeah. Did you, did you ever dream about this afterwards? Uh, no, I really didn't. I, I told my wife about it. I told people about it, and yeah. everybody kind of said, well, you know, uh, you're probably just kind of well, heat exhaustion or something like that. But well, you no, send me a letter no. and uh, with your uh, name address, and maybe I could give you a phone call back because it, it's, it's something I'd like to follow up. All right, good. Uh, Thanks uh, very much. Please do that, caller. And, Bud, there are a lot of plane crashes, not a lot, but uh, a significant number, and, of course, car crashes, and I guess I want to ask, could some of them be the result of some sort of time loss and improper recovery? Well, things like that could happen. Uh, you know, I obviously the the after effects of these experiences are are uh, unfortunate enough, just in psychologically that uh, I hate to uh, suggest even more possible problems to people. Yeah. Uh, but things have happened. I did uh, look into an automobile accident once that seems to actually a couple of that seem to have had. Uh, uh, causes related to this where it would it would seem nothing was done deliberately but uh, in one case it seems the car was stopped and the people were switched off or taken and then the car was started up before the people were fully conscious and an accident occurred. Oh boy. All right. Uh, on the first time caller line you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Good evening. Turn off your radio please. You bet. Right now. All right. And tell us where you're calling from. Good evening. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, tell us where you're coming from, sir. Uh, Sacramento, but I, they won't uh, publish or they won't broadcast your stations. I got 780 in San Francisco. It's not very clear. All right. Two questions. A question to Bud Hopkins. I wrote him a letter a couple of years ago about a crash of a UFO in uh, Jacksonville under the Naval Air Station, 1964. Mm -hmm. And he had so many letters coming in that he sent me a foreign letter back. And I tried to give them as many details as I could. Mm -hmm. they, they found three bodies in this about, uh, oh, this craft was about 20, 25 feet diameter. Three, the people were about 36 inches high, that's about it. Mm -hmm. And were you involved in this personally, or is it? No, all? I was stopped on the highway. It was, they had all kinds of police fire, everybody, yeah. the Navy, and the, I went to the Naval Base next day, I was interviewing the people there. And, yeah. uh, now, I, I, are you certain you wrote to me rather than to some other organization? Yeah, but I wrote to you. You did? Okay. Well, I wrote to Stan Friedman, too. Yeah, well, I'll have to look into it uh, in, in my files. I just uh, you would you ever send me a postcard with your name and address and explain it so I can then look up your letter? Yeah. Okay? All right, do that, caller. Send him a Thank you very much, and I'm sorry. I hope that I, you know, didn't just drop this one. Okay. Thank uh, you very is, much, sir. Is it hard to handle the amount of mail that you get, bud? Oh, it's extraordinary. And, uh... Uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm still getting, I figure, even though the books have been out for quite a while, and Trudor's missing time, I, I'm still getting probably two new cases, potential cases a day. Oh, brother. And, uh, you know, some of these people are calling in uh, in tears and terrified, and um, it's, um, I have some people working with me and some volunteers, and I've gotten some funding and so forth, but uh, our organization, that's one of the things that with Intruders Foundation, we have a newsletter. And we're just about to do another one. Uh, we're way behind on getting it out. It's uh, 22 pages. Uh, yeah, I believe that's it. Um, and we're going to be dealing with um, uh, children's experiences and uh, how to handle the problem with your little child is reporting these experiences. But at any rate, we, uh, if people subscribe at $25 a year and join, if and that uh, entitles you to four of the newsletters plus special reports from time to time and uh, the, the knowledge that you're helping to support uh, uh, a referral service, which is national. All right, uh, and I, I presume they could contact, get that through the same address. Is that correct? Yes, exactly, that same address. All if right. For information, we will send them material. All right, and that address is if if uh, box three zero two three three, 
New York, New York, zip code 10011. That's if box 30233. New York, New York, 10011. Do I have it correct? That's correct, yes. All right, good. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Yes, this is Brian from Seattle. Yes, Brian. And this is going to sound crazy, but, of course, everything uh, you're talking about to, you know, someone who's not really, uh, oh, well. Anyway, um, I have Thanks, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been listening for about ten minutes, so uh, I don't know what you've been talking about, but about the uh, abductions and the implants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now... It, and, of course, we enter into these discussions. You have levels of credibility and proof that are really work along uh, a mathematical scale. Like, the more you can really prove, the less you really find out. So, I, I would, as, as a preliminary statement, you might want to listen more to the, the uncredible or the, you know, people you might be able to really discredit their information because they smoke and they drink and that kind of thing. Anyway, I, I, um, I have this thing in my nose. And uh, it's like, I always wondered what it was, and I've got these things in my ears, too. Mm -hmm. But they're really small, and they seem organic, and uh, I didn't know what it was, maybe like some kind of a calcium deposit or something. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, for me, it's not a scary thing, because that's kind of me, in a way. Well, have you had them, I mean, how, how do you know they're there? Well, I can feel them. Yeah. I, I mean, just very slightly, but I, can, I know they're there. Uh -huh. I mean, see, here's the thing. You're talking about credibility. I mean, like, yeah. you're saying I'm going to have them checked out and all this kind of stuff. And here's the very thing you were saying about, well, well, gee, now that the x-ray showed it up, then uh, they came and took it back. Or something. Caller, do you have any reason to believe they're not calcium deposits? Well, no. However, the, <laughs> well, my, my feeling is if, if, if you're really concerned about it, uh, curious about it, uh, I really have it looked at by an ENT man. That's what you really need to do. What? And he can tell you whether it's uh, strange or, or uh, whether it's an explanation. And uh, in other words, call or go to the doctor. No, no, you could, uh, yeah, no, you can have a guy help you out a lot with this, and you could help us too. So. Uh, oh, oh, I get it. Okay, all right. Well, nice talking to you. And you have a happy Easter. Okay, okay, okay all right, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Um, he he calls you as though you are going to declare they are suddenly alien objects and. I guess people have to go out and find out for themselves. On the wild card line, you're on the air with uh, Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Yes, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Bell, uh, I think most reported cases of abduction by aliens are not true, but there are some authentic cases, and these are examples of a government program of mind control in which people are given a, an hypnotic suggestion that they have been kidnapped by aliens. So if the listeners want the truth about this, they should get a copy of Martin Cannon's book, The Controllers, from a mail order service called Prevailing Winds Research in Santa Barbara. All right. Uh, well, thank you. I, I know about uh, Martin Cannon's theories, and uh, I think that uh, the, the government does a lot of nasty things, and perhaps some branches have done some nasty things, but it has nothing to do with explaining abduction accounts, because if this were the case, it would have had to have started under uh, practically under Grover Cleveland or something like that in terms of the president. All right. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Where are you, sir? This is another Art from Edmonds, Washington. Edmonds, Washington. Oh, yeah. Good, Art. Mm -hmm. As I uh, listen to your program, I'm also sitting here reading the April issue of uh, Omni Magazine. Mm-hmm. And the lion's share of this magazine covers the same topic that you're talking about. I just wondered if Bob would know uh, some of the people they mentioned. One of them is a Bob Lazar, L-A-Z-A-R, right. who is a uh, propulsion system engineer who claims to have been hired to examine one of the uh, discs that they had found, and he claims that it is uh, propelled by gravity waves. Yes, all right, listen on the air. Um, Bud... Not Bob, but Bud. Uh, are you familiar with the Lazar story? Oh, yes, sure I you are. Yeah. And uh, uh, George Knapp is the uh, investigator who's done uh, the, be the most uh, uh, careful work in relation to the L Lazar case. And uh, uh, it's an ambiguous case, but there seems to be some solid evidence for his claims. Um, and I, 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 it, it's an extremely difficult topic to go into at any depth. And I'm, it, it's, since it's outside my area of expertise, really, uh, I think that George Knapp would be the man to talk to about that. Bit. All right, and we do speak with him frequently. Stand okay. by. Bud, stand by just one second. We'll be right back to you. 
All right, uh, back to Bud Hopkins. Are you there, Bud? I certainly am. All right, time is short. Um, on our toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hi, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Richland, Washington. Richland, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Gail. I'm curious to know what Bud's uh, opinion is on speculation that our government uh, is well aware of the abductions and the alien things that are going on, but either can't do anything about it and so keep it hushed up, or they're getting something in return and so keep it hushed up. All right, up. I think his view is the first yeah. rather than the latter. What? Yes, we've gone into that, in, and uh, I definitely think they're aware. I don't have any doubt about that. that. But I don't think there's any swap involved. We're not getting anything out of this. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Reno. Reno, Nevada, yes. Bud, mm -hmm. um, is there any other technique uh, of remembering an abduction experience other than hypnosis that you know of? All right, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. There is another technique that has been used, and, of course, uh, people have talked about sodium pentothal and that type of thing, uh, although that's not something I have any... Um, use for myself. Uh, hypnotic regression works very, very well. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a, a new technique which uh, is being used by some psychologists that uh, involves rapid movement of the eyes uh, to, uh, I, I don't know what the motor connection is with memory, but there seems to be one and it has been uh, used successfully by a number of people to elicit information. Uh, you would have to go to somebody trained in that uh, technique, but uh, hypnosis is a very useful technique in the meantime and safe. All right, good. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hello there. Where are you, please? In Seattle. This is Jackie. All right, Jackie, you're hard to hear. Get close to the phone and ask a question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. What's That's up, great. Jackie? Hi, Bud. Hi. I was just wondering if you noticed any significant trends in UFOs, like uh in the things that they're doing? Trends, changes. Uh, mm -hmm. it, well, yes, uh, in the sense that uh, new things are coming, are coming to light all the time, and we don't know whether they're a new trend or whether they've been going on for a long time. This particular uh, thing I'm going to mention, uh, I think has been going on a long time, and that is uh, the UFO occupants seem very interested in how we form relationships. And I just dealt with a couple uh, who are about to get married, and uh, they're in their 20s, and when they first met exactly a year ago, they realized that they knew one another. Uh, they didn't know how, but they know a lot about each other, and uh, there were some amazing uh, uh, connections. I mean, for instance, one of them remembered that the other had a, uh, a birthmark on his chest. Oh, boy. Uh, they knew a lot about uh, their backgrounds and how they looked and talked that when they were younger and how they fixed their hair and everything else. And it seems that they have been abducted over different periods of time at intervals and brought together as if the aliens were studying long term the way relationships are formed. Believe it or not, I have now maybe six or seven cases like this. Now this is something that's not really ever been made public and I don't think it's all that common. But it definitely seems that this has been a systematic arrangement, and even to this point that there's a man in the United States in his 40s who, when he met an English woman here in the United States for the first time, she's about 41, they realized that they've known each other. They couldn't place where. They're both abductees, and when we looked into these experiences, they were first abducted when they were children. <laughs> that implies... One from England, one from the United States. That implies alien matchmaking. Yeah, well, it sort of does. The great dating service in the sky. Yeah, that's said. right. But the basic point is that these, uh, these people uh, assumed all along when they remembered that they knew somebody, they assumed, well, it's a dream or something. I'm having a dream companion, but it's real. Wow. Uh, Toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Time is short. Where are you calling from? Tacoma, Washington. All right, you're on the air. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, sir. I, uh, just a little while ago, I read a book by uh, Jacobs called Secret Life. A very good book, too. An excellent book. And I'm right smack dab in the middle of a book called Abduction by uh, Dr. John Mack. Yes. Uh, uh, John, uh, these are two of my uh, closest uh, <laughs> colleagues and friends. Well, it's, it's interesting what they both say. My question is this. Mm -hmm. These uh, hybrid... Uh, fetuses, uh, children. Mm -hmm. There seems to be two scenarios to what they're doing with them. And I was wondering, uh, which one do you uh, believe? Uh, what are they doing with these children? 
Well, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I'm not sure that we have a scenario as to what they're doing with them. We really don't know what they're doing with them. That's the central question, actually, uh, as David Jacobs has said, about uh, our, our point of knowledge right now. What are the hybrids for? Where are they going? We don't really know. And uh, I, now I haven't read all of the... Uh, of um, John Mack's book uh, fully, it just came out, uh, and I don't know that he makes any presents any scenario for the use of the future of the hybrids. Nor does Dave Jacobs. Well, what were you thinking, sir? Oh, well, he's gone. These are both people that I have interviewed and will interview again. Right. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, we've got to move on. One okay. more, perhaps, on the wild card line. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hello. Hello there. Where are you, sir? Hello. Are you there, caller? No, I guess not. Well, in that case, we'll make it this one. First time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hello. Hi, I'm calling from uh, Albuquerque. Albuquerque, yes. I'd like to ask him uh, if he thinks UFOs have anything to do with uh, the Lost Squadron, uh, like uh, when those uh, five uh, planes disappeared. Oh, yes, the Lost Squadron. Bud, you remember they thought they found it, and then I guess they didn't. What is the story? Yeah, this is the, one of the um, um, uh, Bermuda Triangle issues. Uh, that uh, story has been pretty much uh, analyzed and d discussed and explained away as a series of, ne of, of genuine navigational mistakes, people caught in a storm, and there doesn't seem to be a big mystery attached to it. Now, other things have disappeared. There was a pilot who disappeared, Fred Valentich, off the coast of Australia in 1977, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was... I have heard talking on the radio. I've heard the radio uh, tape of, of the broadcast to uh, Melbourne Tower. That's a genuine case. The, the, the lost squadron, quote-unquote, which did happen, uh, seems to have a natural explanation, though, unfortunately. All right. Well, I guess they say leave them wanting more, and you are. It's a full board we've got here. Bud, um, go ahead and give your address out one more time, would you please? Okay. Uh, you can write to me, care of if, I-F. That's box 30233. New York, New York, 10011. And uh, I can be reached there uh, if you want information, a um, uh, sample of the uh, IF bulletin, uh, information about subscriptions, uh, or especially if you have something to report about personal experiences, uh, we would like to hear from you. And thank you very much. Well, Bud, it has been a pleasure having you on, and I hope we can tap your expertise at some future date. Would, would you possibly be able to come back? No, oh, I think I would. It's uh, it's kind of late here in New York for me, 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, us uh, city boys have to get up early. All right. Bye. But at any rate, uh, I certainly enjoy the program very much, Art, and I especially appreciate uh, our listeners who have uh, who've been so open about talking about their own personal experiences here. It is amazing, isn't it? Thank you, Bud. Thank you. Take care. That's Bud Hopkins. Uh, he's been our guest for the last uh, three hours. I want to thank you all for being here. As I said, there is never enough time. If you would, if you'd like, uh, or even need, and I can understand that after hearing it, a copy of this program or any of the other programs in the Dreamland series, please call the following telephone number 24 hours a day to get it. It is area code 503-664-5600. Let me repeat that. It's an important number if you want a copy of this program or any other Dreamland program. Area code 503-664-7966. Next Sunday, we'll be back with another Dreamland. On behalf of everybody at the network, I'm Art Bell. Thank you.